Good morning. Welcome to Victoria's Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. Again, I want to mention that we are looking for an anointed pianist, praise and worship leader. And if you are one or you know one who would be interested in working with us, then please contact me. My email address is info, I-N-F-O, at victoriousfaith.co. That's V-I-C-T-O-R-I-O-U-S, faith, F-A-I-T-H, dot C-O, C-O like Colorado. Or you can go to my website, which is also victoriousfaith.co, CO like Colorado, and go to the contact page and send me a message. Or you can write to me by postal mail, and that address is Victoria's Faith, P.O. Box 1418, that's 1418, Castle Rock, Colorado, 80104. And also I want to remind you that this Saturday, August 26, is our next Victorious Faith service in North Denver in Thornton. And we're meeting again at the Holiday Inn Express and Suites on the northeast corner of 120th Avenue and Grant Street. That's the northeast corner of 120th and Grant in Thornton at the Holiday Inn, this Saturday, August 26, 6.30. 6.30 p.m., be there. You'll be blessed. I believe the Word of God will be revelation to you and give you answers, keys, tools, weapons to get your victory and breakthrough in your life. That is the that is always the purpose of my teaching. Our messages is always focused on keys to victory, keys to breakthrough. What else can I learn about the word of God and put it in practice in my life that can help bring results in my life? And so I believe you'll be blessed. You'll come when you come, you'll learn uh, some new revelation that will empower you. Or if you already know it, it'll be encouragement. It will be strengthening. It will be reinforcement and reminding you to do it and be diligent with it. So be blessed by coming and joining us this Saturday, August 26 at 6.30 p.m. for our next Victorious Faith service in Thornton at the Holiday Inn Express and Suites. You can go to my website, again, victoriousfaith.co and go to the meeting schedule page and there you will see the details of the time and location and there's a map and you can find it and come join us. You'll be blessed. Now we are studying again this week. We are uh, concluding our teaching on healing and the lesson why some people do not get healed. And last week I thought I was concluding, but on the last day I just sped through, you know, three or four major points and, uh, to finish. And the Lord says, nope, nope, don't speed, don't rush. People need this. And so he just in, uh, told me to go over it again. And so we're looking at some more reasons that we are uh, covering in the re- study, why some people do not get healed. And the last reason was, uh, was the law of obedience or violating the law of obedience, which is disobedience. I wanted to give you two scriptures on that. I did throw them out at you last week, but I don't think, uh, I really had time to go over them again. So I'm going to give them to you again. Two scriptures. Psalm 66, 18. Psalm 66, 18. As a matter of fact, I'm going to back up. Let's read 16 through 20. So we're in Psalm 66 verses 16 through 20. And we're talking about obedience. And this is actually about unconfessed sin. And when we, when we are talking about obedience, it's both to God's written word and to the leadings of the spirit in our heart and to disobey is sin. And so let me read this in Psalm 66 Verses 16 through 20. Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. Now look at verse 18. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Now, sin is disobedience. Disobedience is sin. So it's sin both to the written word and to the leadings of the spirit. And I gave you examples at the very beginning of this point about disobedience of people whom God was calling them into ministry. And I gave you the example of Lester Sumrall. 
he obeyed. He was on his deathbed. He was healed and lived. But there were others, and I won't give you the names. I didn't, and I won't give you the names. But there were others that knowing they were in disobedience, they died. And that was because their disobedience was blocking the anointing. They knew they were wrong. One man I'm particularly thinking of what he knew God was telling him to do something. And he just said, no, I'm not going to do that. And the Lord revealed he would die because he was already ill in, you know, on the sick bed. And he said, I don't care. I'm not doing it. And he even told his family. That's why the story has been made known because he did tell his family and that he said, I'm not going to do this even if I die. And he died. And then another man was a man in ministry and he began actually teaching wrong doctrines and God was sending him man after man after man to tell him, you need to stop teaching that that's wrong. You're in error. You need to stop. And God sent other ministers to that man to tell him and warn him. God spoke to one other minister and said, if he doesn't correct and change, he'll be dead in a year. And that happened. He did not correct himself. He did not change. And he was dead in a year. And it was the man God spoke to another minister of God, whom God had used to go tell him to, to correct his teaching. And God told this other minister that he would be dead in a year if he didn't change and he died. And so that is how we know that story. He would not change. And so there are people who die because they don't change when they know they're supposed to change. When God sends them people to warn them, you need to change. You need to change. You need to change. And they refuse to change. And then they open the door to the enemy. We we've read those scriptures about don't give access to the enemy. We read that in first Peter uh, no, actually Ephesians 4, 27, Ephesians 4, 27, the King James says, neither give place to the devil. Well, we've been talking about place. And then the new American standard says, do not give the devil an opportunity. The new American Bible says, do not leave room for the devil. So that word place is opportunity and room. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Do not leave room for the devil. And the NIV says, do not give the devil a foothold. Do not give him an opportunity. Why? Well, that's first Peter five, eight, first Peter five, eight says, be sober, be vigilant. What is that? Watchful and alert. Be alert and watchful. Why? Because your adversary, adversary is also enemy. And other translations say enemy. Your enemy, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's seeking whom he may devour. If he has to seek and look, then that means he cannot just blanket devour everyone. He would not have to look. He could just knock them down like dominoes. One and the next 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 and the next. Just knock them all out. If there, if he, if he could just devour anybody, but the fact he has to seek and he's looking for those whom he may devour shows us that he cannot devour everyone. And we've talked about how you can close the door on the enemy and not give him place or room or 
opportunity. Well, how do you close the door on the enemy, the devil, to from uh, being able? And John ten ten says the thief comes not only but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So First Peter five eight says he seeks whom he may devour. And John 10, 10 says the thief, and that is the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So all stealing, killing, and destroying are the work of the devil. And yet he's looking for those whom he may devour. And we are commanded in Ephesians 4, 27, don't give him place. Don't give him room. Don't give him opportunity. Well, how do you close the door on the enemy? How do you not give him room? By obeying God, by using the spiritual laws of the kingdom. And that's why we've been talking about the seven primary spiritual laws. Number one, the law of love. So by walking in love, you do not give him room. When you get out of love, which is strife, selfishness, anger, bitterness, resentment, offense, then that is an op- opportunity That is an open door that is place for the devil to enter when you are not walking in love. And then number two, the law of faith. Well, the opposite of faith is fear, worry, and doubt. So if you are walking in faith, you are keeping the door closed. But when you get in fear, worry, and doubt, then you are giving him opportunity and open door. I like to say open door, room, access giving him room, access, open door. When you get out of faith, into fear, worry, or doubt. And then number three is the law of the creative power of words. Well, we know in Proverbs, it says that the power of death and life, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So watching your words, death and life. And when you speak death, when you speak sickness, when you speak defeat, Satan uses those words for access in the same way that when you speak words of faith and life, and I believe I'm healed, God uses those words to bring life and healing in your body, in your situation. God uses your words of life, health, and victory to bring to pass his plan. Satan uses your words of death, sickness, defeat, failure, pain to bring his destruction. He works through words just like God does. So the law of the power of words. And then number four, the law of spiritual authority and you exercising your authority over your body. Well, when you don't, the devil has access. Number five, the law of sowing and reaping. We talked about that particularly in the area of walking in love and showing mercy that you would sow mercy. So you reap mercy because mercy brings healing. Healing is an act of mercy. So you must sow mercy to reap mercy. And then we talked about Now, that was the law of sowing and reaping. Then we've been talking about being led by the spirit, going where he says, go, follow his plan. And in being obedient, you close the door on the enemy. You give no access. You give no opportunity to the enemy to steal, kill and devour, uh, destroy. But when you are in disobedience, Disobedience is a wide open door of opportunity for the devil to enter, to attack, to steal, to kill, destroy, devour. Disobedience is the wide open door for the enemy. And so that's why we must stay in obedience, submission, a humble heart to God. Now, You can, if you, when you do wrong, all you have to do is quickly repent. Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. I was wrong. And boom, the door is closed. No access for the devil. So I'm not saying you have to be perfect. Nobody is perfect, but Jesus Christ. 
We've all made mistakes. Sin is disobedience and everyone has sinned. But what do you do when you sin? Confess and repent. Repentance clears you, brings forgiveness, closes the door. And as soon as you repent, the door is closed and there is no room for the devil to enter. And, you know, the devil is trying to get in to steal, kill and destroy. And as soon as you repent, that door is slammed in his face. It could cut off his nose because he's standing close to that door. But you slam that door closed on him the moment you repent and say, Lord, forgive me. And that is hum- uh, humility. That's the humble heart. Having a humble heart before God is having a penitent heart or a repentant heart. That means is every time you know you've done wrong, you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have gone there. Lord, forgive me. You close the door. Bam, the door's closed. No opportunity for the enemy. But if you harbor that disobedience in your heart, it gives the devil opportunity. And so back to Psalm 66, Psalm 66 and verse 18. If I had cherished sin in my heart or disobedience, the Lord would not have listened. So you see disobedience opens the door to the enemy and it does not give God access. The anointing is blocked. Healing is blocked. Blessing is blocked. Favor is blocked. It's blocked when you're in disobedience. The blessing of God, the healing of God is blocked, but the open door is to the enemy when you're in disobedience. So verse 18 again, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, but God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. God is not wanting to withhold anything from you, but what he does require is a humble heart. And remember, he gives grace to the humble and he gives mercy to the merciful. So you must be humble and merciful to others in order to receive the grace and mercy of God in your life. And so he gives grace to the humble and mercy to the merciful. And a humble heart is a penitent heart. A humble heart is a repentant heart. A humble heart is a submissive heart, a heart that is not saying, I'm going to do it my way. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to go here. I want to go there. It's not the heart that makes his own plan for his life. It's the heart that seeks God and says, Lord, what is your plan for my life? And as Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, Father, not my will, but your will be done. And that's regarding not the benefits of salvation, which include healing. People try to tell you, I had somebody write me, people try to tell you that when you pray for healing, you need to ask, Father, if it be your will. No, that is a benefit in salvation. That's part of salvation. And you don't have to ask if it's his will for the benefits of salvation. Redemption is complete for your spirit, soul, and body and for your finances and material needs to redeem you from the curse of sin and death, which brings sickness to the body, lack and poverty to the finances, division in the relationships. That's what you're redeemed from. All of it is in the benefits of salvation. So when you are asking, Lord, if it be your will, it is not regarding benefits of salvation because it's God's will for all to be saved, for all to be healed, for all to be blessed. That's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross. He bore your sin. He bore your sickness and he was made to be a curse so that you could be blessed. 
That is redemption. That's the work of the cross. It's for everybody to receive. So then you're not asking God for his, if it's his will in that area, healing or increase in blessing or forgiveness of sin, because that's the work of the cross. Jesus shed his blood and died and he wants you to receive. But what is, what you do ask is regarding your daily activities. Where do you go? What do you do? What do you say? To whom? Who do you talk to? It's being led by the spirit uh, on a daily basis, moment by moment basis. And that's where you say, Father, if it be your will, do you want me to go there? Do you want me to talk to that person? Do you want me to take this job? What career do you want me to be in? What job do you want me to be in? Where should I work? Where should I live? Because God has designated the times and places for everyone before the foundation of the world. That's in Acts chapter 17. We read that scripture that he has already prepared the times and places for us. And those are the things that we ask the Lord, if it be your will and the submissive heart to finding the Lord's will for your life, the path for your life, the places for your life, that and then submitting to it, yielding and obeying. That's the humble heart. That's the humble heart. Now, the other scripture I wanted to read to you is in Proverbs 28, verse 13. Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his sins does not prosper. Now, that is not only, but it includes financial, but it's increase and blessing in all areas. It would include your healing and your health. It would include the peace or shalom of your whole life. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised here. Let me check real quick. Yes, it's the Hebrew word salak. Salak. It means to advance, to prosper, to make progress, and to succeed. I like advance, make prog cro make progress and succeed and to prosper. And so that's the word that he who conceals his sins does not advance, does not make progress, does not succeed, does not prosper. Now, sin, again, think of the word disobedience. He who conceals his disobedience does not succeed, advance, prosper. But whoever conf confesses and renounces them finds mercy. The humble heart confesses and renounces your sins. And that just means throughout the day, you know, you said something you shouldn't say. You were judgmental. You were critical. You were angry. And afterward, you say, Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry I was wrong. To admit and confess and renounce that you were wrong is repentance. And that keeps you clean and clear before God. And that keeps the door closed on the enemy. And when you do repent, then you find mercy. And in mercy is healing. Amen. Amen. So there again, I wanted to share those two scriptures with you that I had actually quickly read last week, but I knew the Lord wanted me to go back and read them to you again. That was Psalm 66, 18. Actually, we read verses 16 through 20 and also Proverbs 28, 13, and showing us that when we are repentant, God hears and God releases his mercy, his anointing and his power. Glory, glory to God. Now, I will go ahead and start the next one. I'll bait you with the next reason. And we'll talk about this tomorrow. But another reason why some people do not get healed. I might again think this could be a reason why a lot of people don't. It is lack of diligence or no diligence. I like to say lack of diligence. It sounds a little bit nicer. 
lack of diligence because diligence is necessary. Let me say it like this. You and I probably both know people. They receive a 90% healing, but then they struggle to get the last 10%. They get mostly healed. They're a lot better than they were, but they don't get the full complete healing. I think a big reason for that is lack of diligence because when a person is really sick or in a lot of pain and the situation is serious, they'll be really diligent with their words of faith and studying the word and speaking the scriptures and taking authority over their body and commanding pain to leave. And they, it's like they're in war. They're warring with their faith and they're standing firm and strong and diligent and they get a very noticeable improvement in their body. And then they're 90% better. It's almost gone. And they will, many people, we've all done it really. We let up on our faith and on our words of confessing the word of God and declaring and taking authority of our body, we get slack. And as we get slack, the job does not get finished in our bodies. So be sure to be diligent. Finish what you've started. I'm out of time. We'll pick it up again tomorrow. Remember, God loves you. You're blessed and highly favored by the Lord.